Two days after being sworn in as president, Bill Clinton issued an executive order that allowed federally funded agencies to refer low-income women for abortions. He also directed that American dollars could be funneled to organizations that promote abortion in foreign countries. When Florida abortion clinic owner Joyce Tarno appeared on a local talk show, she gave the following reply when asked what America should do to help impoverished nations that are facing starvation or other natural disasters. Time is running out for us. In 1968, Dr. Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb. And in that book, he stated uh, a thesis that what we should be doing is helping those nations that have a reasonable chance of being able to produce their own food supplies. Those that cannot do that for whatever reason, those people have to just sink or swim on their own. And what we do is try to help those societies become self-sustaining that have a chance to learn how to fish in order to feed themselves. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you ad well, I, mean, I just want to make sure this is clear. Are you advocating, or was he advocating, basically writing off yes. people that uh, have no hope of ever because of the yes. climate or whatever problems of yes. feeding themselves? Sort yes. of like survival of the fittest? Or? Right. And the thing you, is... Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. The more people you help to survive, the more people are going to be reproducing and having children beyond what we can reasonably hope to have so that we can educate and house and feed these people. If you're going to curb population, it's extremely important not to have it done by the damn Yankees, but by the UN. Because the thing is, then it's not considered genocide. If the United States goes to the black man or the yellow man and says, slow down your reproductive rate, we're immediately suspected of having ulterior motives to keep the white man dominant in the world. If you can send in a colorful UN force, you've got much better leverage. After Guttmacher made that statement, America's National Security Council issued a report that was intended to define the United States government's official policy on controlling world population. It was called the National Security Study Memorandum 200. One of its goals was to establish a strategy for reducing the populations of third world countries so that the United States could have increased access to their natural resources, particularly minerals and metals. One of the tactics specified in NSSM 200 was that we might withhold food aid after a disaster if the countries do not accept the American idea of birth control. And this has happened many times all over the world. One example is the uh, southern American country of Guyana, which was hit by a hurricane back in 1997. Now, they had turned down abortion and birth control for 12 years straight, but after the hurricane hit Guyana in 1997, the World Bank said, we will not give you any aid unless you legalize abortion and birth control, and that's exactly what they did. I've seen this several times in Africa, where droughts have hit, and the United Nations and USAID will not assist unless they accept birth control. I've been all through Africa myself and I've seen medical clinics that are full of birth control devices but no safe motherhood delivery kits. There's no uh, anesthesia, there's not even any bandages there. There's crates and crates of birth control bills and condoms. Now while our commitment to birth control is going up every year, our commitment to authentic economic development is dropping. So we see less uh, clean drinking water funding, uh, less school funding, uh, see less medical clinic funding. Another example is Haiti. Uh, Haiti has been hit by hurricanes several times, and uh, the United States and other countries are saturated with birth control. In Haiti now, any woman, 90% of women at least, can now get access to any kind of birth control they want to, government funded, but less than 20% of the Haitians have access to clean drinking water. Now try to imagine there being a natural catastrophe in a country like Canada or Australia or France or England. And we go in there and we say to them, we're not going to offer you any kind of aid unless you accept our philosophy on birth control and population control. That will be outrageous. But that's our standard operating procedure when we go to a black country after a catastrophe of some kind. You cannot believe that we are going to treat people in a foreign country like this and not treat our own population of African Americans the same way. Consider what happened after Hurricane Katrina. One of the first things we did was bring in birth control and contraception. And as we all know, the hurricane disproportionately affected black families in that area. And I seriously doubt if the same kind of disaster hit a middle class white area, the first response would be condoms and birth control. 
The government of Bermuda was blanketing the island with population control facilities and openly stating that their intent was to limit the numbers of blacks. Then in 1958, blacks in the Caribbean rebelled against a Planned Parenthood-led birth control campaign that was exclusively targeted at non-white residents, while at the same time, prosperous white residents were being encouraged to multiply. Following a similar pattern, a 1965 article in the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper reported that under apartheid, the white South African government was relying on targeted birth control as its primary weapon to reduce the number of blacks in the country. The eugenics movement understood they would need to neutralize the opposition they might get from the church. They also knew that this would be especially crucial within the African American community. Their strategy was to manipulate church leadership into selling the illusion that support for eugenics was not inconsistent with the Christian faith. To do this, they would often recruit pastors to be front men for eugenics policies and provide them with prepackaged sermons on eugenics. They also held contests in which awards would be given to the ministers who came up with the best pro-eugenics sermons on their own. This approach proved so effective that an almost identical strategy would be adopted by the American abortion lobby. Years ago, a series of USA Today articles documented that there are large multinational corporations on the New York Stock Exchange today that actually got their start in the slave trade. But when slavery ended and Africans could no longer be financially exploited, many of those same corporations began pouring millions into the eugenics movement. The people they had found so valuable as property, they had little use for as fellow citizens. And again, some of those corporations and foundations and institutions are still around today, and every year they still pour millions into eugenics organizations like Planned Parenthood. In fact, if you look at Planned Parenthood's donor list, it reads like a who's who of corporate America. You also have individual elitists doing the exact same thing. People like Bill and Melinda Gates, Warren Buffett, Ted Turner, and many others have used their own personal fortunes to make sure that the eugenics movement never runs short of money. Of course, if you confront these people or these corporations about their support for organizations like Planned Parenthood, they'll tell you it has nothing to do with eugenics. And if someone is naive enough to believe that, that's fine. But to me, it's like someone saying, yeah, I'll give a few million dollars a year to the Klan, but I'm not really a racist. This idea that man could reinvent the world through eugenics was an elitist philosophy espoused by those who considered themselves to be not only financially superior, but intellectually superior to everyone else. And Planned Parenthood became the golden child of these people because Planned Parenthood is the one who figured out how to make eugenics work. They figured out that the key to racial genocide is not in killing people, but in convincing the target group to commit mass suicide. This is what birth control and especially abortion are all about. And the reason Planned Parenthood has been so successful is because unlike other eugenics organizations, they have always been able to keep their agenda hidden from the public. In fact, sometimes they are even able to hide it from their own people. I will assure you that there are Planned Parenthood employees and volunteers all over this country who have no idea what they're actually involved in. Then there are other people who will look you right in the face and tell you that racism was not the driving force behind the American eugenics movement. And I think you'd have to be a complete idiot to believe that. The truth is that if blacks had never been stolen out of Africa and brought here in chains, there would never have been a eugenics movement in the first place. There would never have been forced sterilizations. There would never have been a birth control revolution. There would never have been a call for the legalization of abortion. And you would have never heard the terms population control and family planning. The fact is, that had slavery never existed, Planned Parenthood would not exist today.